Hello, and welcome to our second in the series, four-part series on Advent. I am Carol Smith, the Associate Pastor of Seniors Ministries at Northview Community Church, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and uh, hope that you're going to find this helpful and fun and just a pleasant way to pass a bit of time. Last week, we started talking about Advent. We said Advent means coming. And so in the period of Advent, which is the four Sundays, the four weeks um, before Christmas, we have some things that we do. And one of the things that we do is we look forward to Jesus coming as a baby into our lives. But we also look forward to receiving what Jesus did for us on the cross when he died. And uniquely, we look forward to Jesus coming again because he promised us that he would. And when he comes again, we'll live with him forever. So Advent means coming. There's some exciting comings. But last week we saw that there's also some responses that are appropriate for Advent. And last week, as we prepare to meet our Savior yet again, the appropriate response is repentance. Saying you're sorry for the things that you've done wrong and receiving God's forgiveness and blessing. This week you're going to see too that repentance schemes uh, holds another important part in our study. Well, Advent has... Advent candles, when we light them, we usually have a theme, one for each week. And the theme for the second week of Advent is peace. Now, peace is a tricky issue. I can remember as a child watching Miss America pageants, and they would ask the Miss America person what she hoped for, and she always said world peace. And as a kid, I thought that was probably a good thing. As an adult, I know that our world is filled with war and famine, natural disasters, human trafficking, disagreements and conflicts amongst family, amongst peoples, amongst countries, and this year, the added addition of COVID. Well, when you look for a definition of peace, most of the dictionaries will tell you is that peace is a state of no war, no conflict, everybody getting along. And while that's an admirable goal to have, I'm old enough to think that it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And it hasn't happened for 2,000 years. So what did Jesus tell us about peace? Jesus lived in a very violent time. And he knew that peace was not just around the corner. Well, Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Think about it. My peace I give you, his peace, not as the world gives, give I to you. Well, what is the peace that Jesus gives us? What is so different from the peace that Jesus gives us when you compare it to the peace the world gives us, or doesn't give us in this case? Well, in Jesus' world, peace has a different connotation and a different meaning. In Jesus' world, peace comes from knowing that God has it in hand. It's often hard to believe that. But God has the world in his hands, and although we can't begin to understand what he's about, we know that the world is unfolding according to God's plan. And when you have that comfort and that assurance, you have Jesus' kind of peace. A peace that happens in you when all hell is breaking out around you. Because you know within yourself, that God has it in hand, that God will ultimately triumph, and ultimately we will welcome Jesus back at his second coming when he comes to live with us forever. We can feel peace in the midst of the horror of today when we hang on to the realization that God is in control. And that's a good word. 
Well, we have a scripture that goes with the second Sunday of Advent, and it's the scripture in Mark. It's the absolutely very beginning of Mark's gospel, actually. And interestingly, Mark doesn't tell us anything about Jesus being born. No birth story, no growing up, no running away from his parents when he's 12 years old. But he does tell us a good story about Jesus' cousin. Here it is. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Does that sound familiar? We talked about it last week. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I loved that when I was a kid. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, you may not know, but John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, or some kind of relationship to Jesus. <laughs> Mary and John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, were cousins. Now, Elizabeth was an older woman who had been barren all her life. She was married to a very um, prominent uh, Levite priest in Jerusalem, and she had everything but a child. Mary was a young girl. She was probably 15 or 16 years old. She was not married. And both women found themselves pregnant at the same time. Now, Martha was pregnant, or um, Elizabeth was pregnant probably about three months before Mary. So she was three months along. When Mary was three months pregnant, at about the time when she'd start showing, her family pitched her off to Elizabeth because Mary wasn't married. And this was a matter of great shame. So she went to stay with Elizabeth. Now, you have to realize, Elizabeth is past menopause in age. And for those of us who have been pregnant, I think we can all identify with the fact that being pregnant when you're past menopause in age would be no picnic. And I can't imagine how she would welcome a young girl to come and keep her company and to <laughs> help with the dishes and the cooking and the other practical things that would be so hard for her to do. She's six months pregnant at this point. So Mary stays with Elizabeth until she has her baby. Elizabeth has a baby, and against um, most traditional Jewish naming practices, she names him John. And he grows up. Now, Elizabeth and Mary were close enough that they spent time together when they were pregnant, and I can't believe that that bond didn't lead them to be together as often as they possibly could be while, they were growing, while the boys were growing up. And it stands to reason that Jesus and John probably hung out together the way you hang out with your cousins. My cousin, I have only have one cousin, and he's such an important part of my life, even though I don't see him very often. So you can imagine that Jesus and John had a good time. But Jesus and John were very, very different in their circumstances. John's father was a high priest. He was, had high favor in the priestly ranks of the Levites and worshipped and served in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus' father was a carpenter, a very lowly occupation. John's parents were very old, like 50s, 60s, 70s. We don't know exactly, but, but, but very old. Jesus' parents were very young. His mother... 15 and 16 when she had him. His father on earth, also a young man. A generation or two difference in the ages of their parents. John the Baptist's parents were desperate for a child. They had wanted a child all of their lives. And no matter what Mary says, you have to understand 
that this is not an easy pregnancy for her because she's not married. She hadn't anticipated or planned on having a child, and she really has no explanation that she can give anyone of why she's pregnant. Now, John grows up an only child, and I imagine uh, he was the, uh, <laughs> the uh, nemesis for his parents. Uh, by the time we meet him, he appears in the wilderness. Um, the wilderness was, as it suggested, pretty remote, and uh, John apparently lived there. Now, if you had an only child and he lived in the wilderness and he wrapped himself in camel fur and ate locusts and honey, you would perhaps not feel like uh, introducing him to great Aunt Mildred. He's an unusual person. Jesus, on the other hand, stays at home. He looks after his brothers and sisters. He probably, he had at least, according to the Bible, he had at least eight brothers and sisters. He's the oldest. You can be darn sure he did a lot of babysitting. And he learns his father's trade, carpentry, as was the, as the traditional way of being. You see, John should be a, a priest in the temple, but he's out in the wilderness eating bugs. Jesus learns his father's trade and stays at home practicing it because he won't begin his ministry until he's 30 years old. Now, in Isaiah, which is an Old Testament book, we read that Jesus has a messenger who comes before him, a person who's going to come ahead of him and say, hey, look, repent and get ready to meet Jesus and do it, and it's my job to lead you to it. It's not my job to be Jesus, but it is my job to lead you towards him. Now, this has always struck me as a credit to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Elizabeth and Zechariah were eminent people with a high calling on their lives. Joseph and Mary were young and humble. But it was Mary, who was young and humble, who has the Savior's child, the child Savior. Now, think about what that means. It has to mean that Elizabeth and Zechariah raised John to understand his role, and to understand that it was not the more important role. The more important role belonged to Mary's son. And it's a tribute to them that they were able to raise him in such a way that he could go forth and minister very, very powerfully in the second position. Well, John appears, and he begins baptizing people for, uh, with a baptism of repentance so they can have their sins forgiven. Um, and I must admit, for the first time, when I read this to you just a minute ago, it struck me that the people who came were the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem. Now, I'm 72, and I've never noticed that before the whole Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem. You know how many people that were introduced by John to Jesus and his coming. Well, John says you're going to be baptized with a baptism of repentance. So you confess your sins, you receive God's forgiveness. And guess what? With the forgiveness comes peace. Not as the world gives. He gives to us. Well, that is a pretty good word for the second Sunday in Advent. Now, we're spending some time each week taking a look at some of the traditions of Christmas and Advent that have gotten so far from their origins that we, we miss the meaning. And today's story is a story that is particularly prominent in that category of missing the meaning of what it's about. And it has to do with a saint. The saint's name was Nicholas. He lived in Turkey, and he lived in the fourth century. So the 300 and some odds. Long time ago. Now, he didn't write anything himself. He was a bishop in the church. He was uh, the son of very, very wealthy parents. 
And apparently he hadn't um, given up his wealth the way uh, some people are called to do by the Lord. He wasn't called to do that. But he used his wealth in unique ways. And a number of stories are told, many stories are told, about St. Nicholas and his generosity. And that's what he's gone down in history for. Now, these stories are stories that are called apocryphal. It means <laughs> at their heart, there's a kernel of truth in them. But they've been told and retold so often and embellished and, and adjusted to each person's personal preference that they probably are not true the way we understand things to be true. But they are stories told, and in them they will find a kernel of truth. And that's what makes them worth listening to. Not the way you listen to scripture, but to pay attention. So pay attention to the story about St. Nick. St. Nick lived in a town in Turkey where poverty was rampant. And he had a, a, made friends with a man who had three daughters and uh, no wife. And these three daughters are being raised by this poor man, and he's having a hard time with it. But what is really, really hard for him is that he can't afford to buy, provide them with a dowry. Now, a dowry would be a sum of money that the father of the bride would give to the groom's family to um, maybe pay them to take to the daughter. I, <laughs> that's a rather um, scandalous thought. But at any rate, the money was handed over by the bride's father to the groom's family so that um, the wedding could proceed. And this poor man had no money for this dowry. In those days, in that land, if you were a single woman, probably by about the time you were 20, 22, you were over the hill. If you were unmarried and you were poor, the prostitution was about the only um, step that you could take. And this man knew that his daughters were probably going to be relegated to that. Well, as the story goes, Nicholas, not wanting to be seen, slipped out one night, quite late, and he went to the man's house, and because he had a um, bag full of coins, gold coins, and he took the gold coins and he threw them in the window and ran away. Now, in some versions of the story, he doesn't throw them through the window, he climbs up on the roof and drops them down the chimney. And if you're thinking, you might start to wonder. At any rate, this bag of coins lands in some stockings that the girls have hung out to dry by the fireplace. And in the morning, they find them, and you can imagine their ecstasy because that means that their oldest sister can get married. Well, guess what? Next night, late, window, or chimney, same thing, bag in, in the stockings. And it was repeated the night after that as well, so that the fellow was provided with stocking money for all three of his daughters. So they could be married and saved from a life of profound misery. Well, by 1822, a man named Clement C. Moore wrote a Christmas story, and in it he referred to a small elfin-like creature, but lo and behold, called St. Nicholas. Now, you should be connecting it with no trouble at this point. The St. Nicholas of the story has become what we call Santa Claus. And in many countries of the world, children enjoy the gifts of Santa Claus in Christmas. But in many countries, Turkey, definitely one of them, other Middle Eastern countries, and interestingly enough, in Holland, in the Netherlands, St. Nicholas is still celebrated rather than Santa Claus. Celebrating this man who so many years ago had been kind to a poor fellow. And it happens to be this weekend that the celebration occurs. So you may find some people around Regina that are celebrating this way. And what happens is, is the story goes on and gets much more elaborate, and St. Nicholas visits the houses of all the children, and he leaves presents. The children leave their shoes out the night before, Saturday night, actually. They'll leave their shoes out, and in the morning, the shoes will be filled with presents for good children and lumps of coal for bad children. And time goes on, and St. Nicholas is now armed with uh, a 
fellow that goes along with him named Peter, and he has a horse and a whip and a few other <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy customs that go with it. But all of it is that kids wake up in Holland, in uh, Turkey, in other places in the world to welcome their gifts on, on the morning of St. Nicholas' arrival. So this Sunday is St. Nicholas Day. Now, you can see from the story, you can understand, and often as parents we worry about our children's obsession with Santa Claus and wondering. And it's certainly something that we want to keep in balance. But it's important for us to know that that comes from an early Christian bishop who was giving a blessing to a poor family in his town. And if we remember that, and perhaps tell the children the story of St. Nicholas and his gifts, then we can help them expand their understanding of what it means to give good gifts to other people. Well, we've got repentance leading to peace. We've got a peaceful bishop of the third century Blessing not only a father of three daughters, but us today with his story. And so I thought, well, peace, as the world understands it, probably translates into a couple of Christmas crafts. And so I'm a big one for Christmas crafts, as many of you know. And so today we're going to take a look at making a Christmas dove. Now, this is so simple, and as I told you last week, all of my crafts are hopefully going to be made with things that you already have in your house, so you don't have to go out and buy anything. So hopefully you've got something. Now, this is ordinary paper, and it will work, but it's a bit flimsy. And if you've got something a little bit heavier um, of, card weight, of card weight, that's better, but you can still make them out of these. You want to make them a little smaller. This stuff is really too big to be cute. But I made them big so that you would be able to see them. So you can see, your first task is to draw a bird and cut it out. And you are going to say, oh, I can't draw a bird. Ah, can't do that. What am I going to do? And I'm going to tell you my secret for bird drawing. I taught from school for many, many years. And I had to draw lots and lots of birds. And I couldn't do it because I'm a terrible artist. But I did develop this trick. So watch and learn, people. And there's no charge for the trick. First of all, you draw a big smile. You see it? Then you put a head on the smile. Now, that basically is it. A big smile with a head on one side. You can, if you want to and you're so inclined, add a beak. You can add feet. You can add, now, Two feet, please, yes. Um, and then, this is not going to look exactly right because I can't get this to look right, but more crafty people than I can add a long tail to it. And there it is. And you did it all by yourself, just like me. So make yourself a bird pattern and cut it out. Now, this craft, making birds, is one that I like to put on my Christmas tree because doves of peace are a wonderful addition to a Christmas tree. And I make them about that big, you know, square, about that big, quite tiny. And they're quite sweet. But you take your bird and you take your scissors and you poke a hole and you cut along just a cut mark both directions through the middle. I like that. Simple as it can be. Then you take a sheet of white paper and you go back to your childhood and remember the fun that you had folding fans where you'd fold one way and then the other way and you would keep going and folding and going and folding and folding. And it took just about this long when I was a kid. It doesn't matter if it's even, it doesn't matter if it's, we just need to get it folded back and forth like a fan. There we are. So, fan, push it together. Then, grab it at one end. So now you're holding it like this. And this is the hardest part of all. You have to slip this 
end into the slot that you cut. Now, the easiest way to do it is just to hold it like this and push a bit, and it'll let you get it in. And you push it <laughs> halfway. And there you are. Now, to enhance the dove, I always bring the two wings together, because it makes them look a little fancier. And you tuck your paper punch and poof, holding the paper punch properly, make a hole. And then you can take a ribbon or a string or a piece of thread, or if you're very fussy, a piece of um, uh, fishing line, because I don't like the hanging threads to show on my decoration. But I'm a perfectionist, so you don't have to do that. And then you stand around and figure out how to get this through the hole. And when you finally do, you have ready for your tree. Or these are very pretty if you make a lot of them, a flock of them, and hang them in a window. They make a lovely window decoration. They make a lovely decoration for just somewhere in your home that's looking a little lonely, and you might have a spot. They make a lovely decoration for a Christmas tree. And if your tree is as big as this one, you might be able to take ones this big. If it's not, make them smaller. You can make them any size you want, all with the same technique. Draw a smile and put on a head. I added a beak. I didn't bother with feet, didn't bother with the other. And you still get a really, really lovely, pretty Christmas decoration that just comes from things at home. Now, if you are younger of spirit, this is for you. Now, perhaps you have children at your house. What have I done with my tape? Oh, here it is. Um, if you have children at your house, this is sure to be a winner. And I'm thinking of some of the little boys in our congregation right now and thinking how much fun they're going to have. You start off with two plastic spoons. And you get some kind of a weight. Now, I've just taped a few uh, watch batteries together that I happen to have. And you tape them in the middle. Now, you can use a marble. You can use a washer from the toolbox. Um, you can use several small nails. Just something to give it a light bit of weight. And you tape it inside, like this. Then you take the next spoon and you snug them together like this. And you take, actually, two pieces of tape. Any kind you want. It'll look a little bit better if your tape is cellulose tape or scotch tape, the way I call it, having grown up with that. And you tape the handle together. Then, next step, guess what? Take your sheet of paper and make another fan. And when you've got your fan made, take it and slide the fan down. So you've got your spoons like this, all right? And you've got the two spoons together at this end. And you've taped it down here, but not over here. And you slide the wing in, because now you know it's a wing. And you slide it in, and you get it centered about central. And then you take more tape, and you tape this end. And I like to tape it over to the wing, because that just helps make it a little more secure. And then you puff out your wings, and you have <laughs> sort of a dove. <laughs> I made these one year with the children at the church I worked with in Toronto, and they were so incredibly popular with the little boys and the little girls, and they all adored them. I think the parents were ready to kill me, and we made them every year thereafter, and it was the thing that they remembered most about Christmas was the doves of peace, because watch what you can do with it. Ha! Isn't that fun? I must admit that I, too, love <laughs> so, a dove, light card, 
a dove for you in your fun moments or for children or grandchildren to make and to enjoy whizzing around the house before Christmas. Two Christmas crafts about the peace that comes at Christmas. And so I'd like to close today in prayer. I'll be back next week with the third week in Advent and looking forward to seeing you then. But let's pray. You are the God who gives us peace. This second week of Advent causes us to remember that because of Jesus, we can experience Christmas no matter what our situation. Regardless of our circumstances, you offer us the peace that passes understanding. Amen. So this week, people, spend a few minutes concentrating on places in your life and a space in your life where you can find peace. Because God has this in hand. It's unfolding according to his purpose. And he makes good of everything he does. Goodbye for now.